Thank you everyone sincerely for joining and welcome to today's event, Gaza's Ongoing Catastrophe, co-hosted by the Green Olive Collective and Gisha. My name is Erez Bleicher and I'm the Communications and Membership Director of the Green Olive Collective, a binational advocacy, information and tour guiding cooperative committed to a democratic future and an end to the ongoing displacement of Palestinians. We provide communities around the world with insights into the apartheid policies of the occupation and the resources to engage in meaningful advocacy in solidarity with Palestinians. Your contributions for today's event will be split between Gisha and the Green Olive Collective and go to sustain both of our work to advocate for Palestinian freedom of movement, to fundamentally shift the landscape of discourse around Israel-Palestine, to advance an expansive and robust vision of justice and to raise local and transnational awareness about the violence of occupation and military closure. We need contributions from you, our wider community, in order to cover the cost of this event and to sustain future public initiatives in support of human rights. You can donate at greenolivetours.com slash contributions, which I've just put into the chat. And we will donate 10% of proceeds from today's event to the Palestine Children's Relief Fund, which provides health care for children in Gaza and is developing a pediatric cardiac surgery health care program for children in Gaza in Khan Yunis. Uh, we will also donate part of today's proceedings to the Human Rights Defenders Fund, HRDF, which provides free legal counsel to human rights de defenders engaged in nonviolent opposition to occupation. They provide free legal counsel to many communities in the West Bank defending their land and rights in interminable court cases. And I can tell you from personal experience that their work is indispensable. Isha, our co-host for today's event, is an organization that has worked since 2005 to protect the freedom of movement of Palestinians, particularly in Gaza, and to secure their right to life, medical care, education, livelihood, um, and freedom of religion. For close to 20 years, they have engaged in legal advocacy and public awareness building, uh, public awareness building to challenge the system of severe restrictions and closures implemented in Gaza and the West Bank have helped thousands to overcome travel restrictions and access life-saving services, have been instrumental in reversing the ban on Palestinian students studying abroad and in the West Bank and in exposing the inhumane rationing of produce and food Israel has allowed into Gaza. Today, we are joined by Mayan Cohen, Gisha's resource development coordinator, Donna Mills, Gisha's Director of International Relations, and Mohamed Azaiza, Gisha's Field Director in Gaza, all of whom will, of course, introduce themselves more fully shortly. Uh, and they are here to speak with us about the ways Israeli policy has created an ongoing humanitarian and political catastrophe in the Gaza Strip. Gaza, as many of you most likely know, is often referred to as the largest prison in the world and has been under closure since 2007 with almost annual military assaults by Israel and a near total ban on international observers, it is more important than ever for all of us to educate ourselves and bear witness to the systems of violence that permeate daily life in Gaza, especially following the truly heart-rending and heart-wrenching events of the last month. Um, it is particularly important and we are particularly grateful for Kisha and to you, Mayan, Dana, and Mohammed, that you've joined us today. Thank you for your presence and for the perspective that you'll be sharing. Um, I'll pass it to you now. And I think the last day I'll do that before that is just to say that at the end of this session, we're going to, of course, open up to the, the discussion to question and answer. So everyone here should already from this moment on, as all of our friends from Gisha begin to the, the speak and share with us, feel free to put questions into the chat. If at the beginning of your question, you can just write the word question with a colon or a dash, I'll be able to spot it. Spot it. And then I'll be collecting the questions throughout the session and integrating them into the Q&A at the end. Um, so thank you, Donna, Mayan, and Mohamed. Um, and I'll pass it your way. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to see people from so many different places all around the world. It's really incredible to have you all tuning in today. Um, we'll quickly each introduce ourselves, although Arez did a fabulous job already. Um, I'm Mayan. Um, I saw some of you from the UK. I'm uh, born and raised in London. I've been in, with Gisha since August, so almost a year now. Um, and I'm 
as Eris mentioned, uh, Gishal's resource development coordinator, and I'll, I'll quickly pass on to Dana. Hi everyone, seconding my Anne's comments, I'm really, really um, inspired to see so many people putting in time on a Sunday to talk to us. I'm the Director of International Relations before coming to Bisha, I was the Director of Peace Now. And I'm especially pleased to see a comrade from North Wales as I'm actually half Welsh, half Israeli. So I don't think there are a lot of odds having two people from Wales on a Zoom on Palestine. So that, that's a nice perspective there. Mohammed, would you like to say a few things about yourself and your work in Gisha? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. My name is Mohammed Azaiza. I'm from Gaza. Uh, I joined Gisha 2010 as a field researcher in Gaza, and uh, I'm now wo working like doing a research and also coordinate all Gisha work at Gaza City. I'm originally from 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 the Strip, and I'm so happy, and it's my pleasure to join uh, this webinar with uh, Green Olive, and also to see all of these people. I hope this session will be interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dana and Mohammed. Um, so I'll start with a quick introduction on Gisha. Um, as Erez mentioned, we're an Israeli not-for-profit organization founded in 2005, whose goal is to protect the freedom of movement for Palestinians, especially Gaza residents. In Hebrew, Gisha means access and approach. Um, and the reason why we focus on freedom of movement uh, is because we see this as a precondition for exercising all other basic rights, so the right to education, a career, family life, medical care, religious freedom, etc. you name it. Um, Gisha protects the right to freedom of movement as guaranteed by international human rights law, humanitarian law, and Israeli law. And we do this through a mixture of legal and pub legal work and public advocacy, although the legal work is really our bread and butter. Um, and this includes legal assistance, representing individual clients uh, and groups via administrative channels and in the courts, principled legal advocacy, when, which we, when we aim to change sort of access policies more broadly, uh, public advocacy such as this event here, um, as well as uh, research, which um, as Mohammed mentioned, um, he is our Gaza-based field coordinator and who, what department he's a part of. Um, so we should probably start by thinking about the very recent uh, assault that, that was just on the Gaza Strip and the recent war that we had um, between the 9th to the 13th of May when Israel attacked Gaza. And this was only nine months after its August assault. Um, and like facts just after the, you know, as the dust settles, this led to 33 Palestinians in Gaza killed, including six children, 190 people injured, uh, 103 homes destroyed, and 140 homes damaged to make them uninhabitable, with an additional almost 3,000 homes partially damaged. And um, this also led to over 1,000 uh, internally displaced people. But we're here also to talk to you a day that you know when the dust settles and Gaza gets out of the spotlight and the media moves away from the outcomes of of another round of violence we are left with the status quo and the status quo um is is a is a catastrophe as as Erez pointed out um not only is there picking up pieces the mental health trauma of war but there's also uh the economic situation and the permit regime that is violent in and of itself um, at Isha, we call this acts of bureaucratic violence. So we're coming up to around, we, we're just at 16 years of closure of the Gaza Strip. Um, and just to put this into perspective for you, 40% of Gaza's population are under the age of 15. So 40% of Gaza's population have not known life outside of Israeli closure of the Strip. Um, and and what does what does closure what does closure actually mean? What does it what does it look like? Um, maybe Dana, you want to take this on? Yes, actually, I wanted to pass to Mohammed because um, we're really really lucky to have Mohammed with us on the Zoom and to have Mohammed as a colleague actually. Um, and I'd love for you to say a little bit about what the mood is like right now in Gaza after the war after it. You know, there's a lot of things happening in the sequence. 
Um, Neva Del Moments, if you want to say a few words about how things are right now. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Actually, when we, when we sp speak about escalations, actually, uh, that's usually bring me back to the, to the days and the nights of the escalations uh, when it's happened. And that's really something that we suffer from inside Gaza, which is the mental health st status of the people. And actually, uh, I believed and I agreed that like most of people residents, like affected by the number of escalations and the ongoing closure in Gaza. For example, like in the recent escalation in Gaza in, 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 in August, and like in five days, while we spend all the 24, 24 hours inside the home, the things that usually come to your mind that what next, what will happen in the next minutes, what will happen in the next hours with you during the escalations? You, are you still able to secure and to protect your children as a father in Gaza or not? As you, are you able as a father to cover all the needs for your children, for your family inside the home or not? And the problem that you are not able to find like many options. You know, you cannot choose, for example, to travel or to escape. Usually when we speak about like escalations or, or war, there's like a choices for the people. People can like run away or like they can like cross the borders to another country. They can, for example, find like a, a protected area or like a protected home or a protected room to be in. But what is in Gaza? In Gaza, there's like nothing. You cannot like cross the borders during the war. You cannot fly. Also, we don't have the infra infrastructure to, to be like a secure from the rockets. So the result sometime, even if it's clear, but it's hard. Uh, that's like a part of the story, but the problem when you like live this for a long time, I speak about escalations for a debate, like since like uh, many years, more than 10 years, I can't remember like how many round of escalations have been in Gaza. And that's really every time like uh, you push yourself that still there's like hope to continue the life or you push yourself to that you should like advocate and speak about the problems. But that's usually what Mayan like mean when, when it's a start. Usually we attract the media and attract the news when we are under fire. When we you saw like a murder and, and like children killed and families home destroyed, like many international agency and the news, they focus in Gaza. But when it's shut down, it's also like shut down and it's become like a boring story. That's really something that we, we start to feel in Gaza. Mm. Thank, Thank you. Very, Thank you very much, Mohammed. I'm going to pop in the chat Mohammed's recent op-ed for Haaretz, which is really powerful about the experiences just after um, this escalation. And also a report that Gisha published just a year ago around the mental health crisis in Gaza. And I think just to echo what Mohammed said, it's sort of from our advocacy perspective, it's really important if there's one thing you take from this webinar, if there's one thing you take from this briefing, is to put Gaza on the agenda, even when it's not there. Because there is a moment in the year when everyone talks about Gaza and then all these statistics rise and then people are pulled anew. And then once a ceasefire is signed, things go back to normal, but normal is a catastrophe. And it's, it's an escalation waiting to happen again. So, our goal in Gisha from an advocacy point of view and for our sort of calling all of you, because we're all sort of doing the same conversation, right? What we're trying to advocate in whichever circles we are is to keep Gaza on the agenda. We, we can later chat also about the relationship between Gaza, the West Bank in 1948 Israel. The relationship is complex, but it's important to understand it. But um, yeah, I think for us, this is our one, one thing to do after this. 
webinar. Dana, I'm sorry to interrupt you for a moment. I just wanted to add to that and echo what you're saying so people appreciate how valuable what's happening right now in this session is, which is say part of the reason that Gaza sometimes fades from international discourse is because it's much harder, even for people on the ground who live an hour, an hour and a half, like mm -hmm. myself, from Gaza, to have ongoing sustained contact, communications, yeah. relationship with people in Gaza because of the closure and because of the restrictions on freedom of movement. Yeah. Um, I have and others involved in principled opposition to the occupation, um, ongoing sustained relationships with people in the West Bank, but that's made so much more difficult by Israeli po policy with people in Gaza. And it's so valuable, Mohammed, that we can have you here, um, yeah. despite what people around the world might not realize are additional challenges around electricity and internet, lighting, et, et cetera. Um, it's really valuable, but it's important that often people can only communicate with friends and colleagues in Gaza over virtual channels like this. So yeah. it's really valued and cherished and thank you. Anyway, sorry to disrupt them. Please go on, great. I just want to highlight. Great, great, um, great points. And um, maybe it's a good time to go kind of into what does closure actually look like and what does it uh, actually affect and what does it mean? Um, just to give you a little uh, history, um, after Hamas took power by force in 2007, um, Israel Security Cabinet declared Gaza a hostile entity and severely tightened restrictions on movement for its residents and has been used as a means of economic warfare, allowing for only the humanitarian minimum. Um, so nobody and nothing can exit or enter Gaza without Israeli permission. Gaza borders Israel, its eastern and northern perimeter, Israel controls access via these perimeters as well as maintains control of the sea space and the air space. Um, they are also in control of who gets in, who comes out, um, and they even control the electromagnetic space. So Gaza is kept on a 2G network. Um, Israel screens and sorts all goods going into Gaza. Um, this is, you know, Mohammed was talking about the infrastructure of having safe rooms, like with Israel's dual use policy, these things aren't able to be created. Um, Israel determines which good producing Gaza can exit the strip, how, where, how many, like how many vegetables can enter at what point, and there's all these different restrictions. And anyone seeking to enter or exit the strip via Israel's territory must receive a permit from Israel. And there are only a very narrow set of circumstances in which Gaza residents can receive such permit. So the three main categories for people who are eligible to cross at Erez crossing, which is the people crossing, are um, trader and worker permit holders, um, medical patients, and sometimes their companions when they're um, granted the permit, often they're um, issued a security block, or um, exceptional humanitarian cases, which includes the entry or exit for the funeral of a first degree relative, the entry or exit for a wedding um, for a first degree relative or the entry or exit um, to visit a critically ill first degree relative. Uh, and this, of course, causes serious infringement on the capacity to live a normal life. Um, on top of this, application processes are unreasonably long. Um, for example, according to official directive, an application to visit a sick uh, child or parent may take up to 50 business days and applications by patients from the Gaza Strip to exit for medical treatment may take up to 23 business days, regardless of the medical appointment date. And even with these officially long wait times, people are often waiting even longer, or they don't hear back at all, um, or they are issued um, a security block without further explanation as to why they've been issued a security block. And in the past, when we've um, sort of questioned these or, or sent a petition in to taking these kind of cases to court and um, the blocks uh, will be removed once Fisha has filed a petition so they they can sometimes be placed kind of arbitrarily um, we recently uh, had a case of a patient in Gaza who is in need of a specific kind of medical treatment um, that is unavailable in the strip and without which he will need to have his leg amputated um, but unfortunately like not just unfortunately, like uh, terribly, the, um, a, his, his permit application has been denied again and again. 
Um, and, and cases such as these are very common and ongoing and of, of course contribute to uh, a humanitarian crisis as well. Um, I'm wondering if um, Mohamed Odana, you wanna talk about any other cases similar kind of currently that are going on? I, th I think just to add on the, the said case, I put also in the chat an article that was about it also recently in Haaretz. Um, the complexities of such cases is Gaza has borders both with Egypt and Israel, but Israel de facto controls many of the exits and Egypt itself doesn't open its border easily and it's very difficult to get out through Egypt. So to save you from the first question of why not Egypt, why are you talking about Israel? First of all, we are an Israeli organization, we pressurize Israel, but also it's not always effective. In this case, some of the complexities, as Mayan described, of Hamas taking power in itself, um, causing a lot of suffering in the script. The said patient was actually imprisoned and his condition worsened while, while he was imprisoned by Hamas. So you have kind of like triple um, threats that are endangering the lives of patients, of people generally on a day-to-day -day basis. This is one of the most extreme cases we've dealt with recently, and it's an urgent humanitarian case. And even then, we weren't able, we're now in the second petition, and we're still not able to get said patient his permit. But there are many cases like this um, ongoing. Um, we have quite a lot of cancer patients. We have um, one of the other uh, rubrics that we engage with a lot, which is also a way to segue to talk more about the geopolitical context, is families that are split, that are split between either Gaza and the West Bank or Gaza and Israel. Israel also controls their movement. Um, very often you have first degree relatives who don't get to see their relatives or who see them once every, um, as Mayan described, in sort of very um, rare occasions. Um, so these are also cases that we deal with, even not in cases of illness um, or, or you know, threat to life, but just siblings who want to see each other, parents who haven't seen their children for, year, for, for years and years, grandparents who don't know their grandchildren. So these are some of the cases we do on an ongoing basis. Um, and you know, every case is shocking and new. And there's no case that is just straightforward and makes sense because none of this permit regime makes sense. It's kind of keeping civilian population under collective punishment for 16 years without, without any international accountability. So um, I can invite you, I sent uh, yeah, a link to one of Gisha's uh, reports. You can sort of look, we have a lot of cases on our website, um, but generally every single case, when you think about the context, when you think, I also invite you and we often do in public webinars to think about when was the last time you saw your sibling? When was the last time you saw your family around um, the, you know, a kind of special occasion? We've just finished celebrating Eid. Again, the closure doesn't allow many families to see each other. I mean, it doesn't allow people from Gaza to go and pray in sacred places. Freedom of religion is greatly infringed upon throughout the closure. So there are many aspects to this kind of daily reality that are completely illogical and have just been kind of made normal. So whereas you might see a lot of um, headlines and there's a lot of discussion around um, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, things that are ongoing there, just imagine this is the reality and this is what's given as fait accompli. I don't know if you, Mohammed, you want to add anything. Yeah, actually, uh, maybe something important, uh, usually we speak about it like uh, and reflect it by number when we speak about electricity and water. Uh, but that's something uh, which is like, uh, go with us since like 2006 until now that we still, uh, until the, the program and the regime of the electricity, when it's come just like eight hour on following that eight hour off. And that's that's something maybe you, you listen to this message that they just come eight hour on and they it, it go out like for eight hour off. What that's mean? That mean that you have to adapt yourself like during the cut of the electricity, you have to find like another resources and you are the responsible about it. And also about the water, as you may know that like 97% of of Gaza aquifer water, it's not healthy or it's not good for like a human use. And we need like a desalination unit. Like until now in Gaza, if you want to drink water, you have to buy it. Even if in, in our situations, even if all, with all of this like humanitarian assistance, but until now, like 
you 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 have to buy the water you want to drink you have the buy you to buy the water you want to use in cooking for example uh, that's something usually like uh, when we talk about it usually the international media speak about the resilience of gaza people how they are able to adapt their self with the change if israel cut the electricity they find like resources and generators if they cut the the waters they try to do like a distillation units or do something if they ban the cements they can do this like the way of like coping with with the with the problems and difficulties the resilience of the people but for how long this resilience can continue the problem now that the people especially the international organization who implement the program in gaza with the children and women recently in the last two years they just speak about the mental health status of the people how many people suffer from post uh, post stress like the people uh, like interact social relations between the people in Gaza. There's something affected by the long closure that continues since more than 17 years until now. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I'm, I'm aware that we want to um, ensure that we have enough time um, to take questions. Um, but first, perhaps we'll just talk about um, some of the other kind of some of the other situation in which the closure operates. So um, we kind of mentioned it before, but um, just talking about uh, the separation policy between um, Israel, uh, sorry, between the occupied Palestinian territory and Israel's uh, method of ensuring that Gaza and the West Bank and East Jerusalem are, remain separate, um, but un inevitably the kind of um, deep and uh, untangleable connection uh, between the occupied territory, of course. Um, Donna, do you want to speak to this? Yes. Um, when you see developments in the West Bank, and you, see, you must remember that the counter element of this is Gaza. So Israel's policy over the years has been to separate population, as I said, the fact of sometimes separating families themselves, but to disable Palestinian continuity, disable any possibility for sovereignty. So um, what we see in Gaza, the kind of long closure is not incidental to the policy of basically what we see now as um, very expedited annexation. These are two arms of the same body, basically. And um, again, this is a political choice. Very often you hear all these statistics around life in Gaza, which are truly horrific. Every time we engage with them, they, they start less than you. This is not a humanitarian crisis, though. This is a man-made political crisis. This is not kind of something that has landed on an area in the middle of nowhere. This is a very intended policy that is meant to create one side of the territory separate from another and to create really harsh conditions, also for political reasons to sort of in, get um, uh, influence the politics in the West Bank and in Gaza both. So again, the statistics are really harsh and are really stark. And it's something that I know always remains with you after you hear them for the first time. But you must remember that there's a logic in all this, and the logic is to separate, to separate different people from their families, to separate different communities from each other, and to separate first and foremost Gaza from the West Bank. So, so this is kind of the logic behind the separation policy. I do want to jump in just for a second and talk a little bit about what the closure means in terms of trade. So we talk about movement of people, and that's obviously the most dramatic iteration on first sight of the closure. But in fact, Israel controls also all aspects of trade into Gaza and out of Gaza, both through the West Bank and to Israel. The West Bank and Gaza, of course, one part of the same territory, and yet Israel controls all the trade. And by so doing, also controls very heavily the economy in Gaza. So for instance, um, one small example, not small in iteration, but small in terms of one thing we've been working on, is um, over the past month and a bit, coming up to two months, Israel has banned all trade of furniture because one truck, one truckload was found to have weapons smuggled in it. Um, 
the, the company that traded in furniture said that they didn't know even that the, the weapons were there, but whether or not, Israel just completely banned all trade of furniture, which is, of course, collective punishment, which is, of course, a violation of international law and harms economically a huge um, sector that has been thriving for many years. Um, so part of living under closure is also living with this contingency. There is a document called Status of Authorizations, which is basically Israel's policy towards different sectors, or Israel's policy towards different elements of permits. You don't know how it's going to change. You don't know how things will intervene in that. So again, part of the, the, the mental health consequences, basically the, the wearing out over years of closure is this kind of con complete contingency and randomness uh, of intervention. And especially when we talk about trade, we see that. There has been a ban on um, trade of fish and as a, another really important trade element for Gaza. Gaza has, of course, a maritime border. Now there's been limitations on, on trade of fish, 30 to 14 million a month, which is nothing compared to what Gaza can send out. So again, there's different elements in which Israel intervenes in life in Gaza, and a lot of them are very random and contingent. It can happen one day, we'll suddenly get a report. We're incredibly fortunate to have Muhammad on the ground, and Muhammad is, sort of knows things from inside out and tells us, and finally we say, what, we didn't know this is happening, and now we have to think how to advocate around this, both in courts and opposite stakeholders. So this is another element of the closure that, again, is not often talks about, talked about, but has these kind of very deep and very um, harmful consequences for people in Gaza. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, perhaps we can move on to questions, Erez. Um, it feels like opportune time. Brilliant. Um, thanks to the three of you for the insight and perspective you shared. Um, thanks again for joining and thanks particularly to you, Mohammed, for being here and sharing. Uh, I myself have many questions I would love to hear all of your thoughts on, but I'll turn it first to the questions uh, from everyone already. Uh, the first of which from Suf, who asked a, general, a broad question about why does Israel create this permit regime? Why is it restricting freedom of movement? I'll actually invite you, Suf, to unmute yourself if you want to ask the question yourself. Uh, I'll give it a moment, and if for whatever reason you can't unmute, um, I'll read the question myself. But you should be able to ask. Oh, oh, this is Suf. Uh... I mean, with, with, uh, uh, I live in the United States, by the way, and I'm originally from Gaza. My brother is there. I've been trying to see him for 35 years. I couldn't uh, until now. So why would it be, I mean, why they restrict the movement of the Palestinians? Wouldn't it be better for them to allow the Palestinians, you know, move? I mean, they will create better people at least and less problems. That's what, uh, that's my question. Um, thank you for your question, Suf. Um, and it's a really good one and it makes a lot of sense. Um, I think uh, we can start by saying that the reason why Israel, um, you know, restricts the freedom of movement of Palestinians is not for the well-being of Palestinians. And um, I think Dana was kind of speaking about it as well in terms of, a pol the political incentive of uh, closure and of uh, movement restriction that with, you know, in between to separate Gaza and the West Bank and therefore to kind of divide and conquer, um, keeping Gaza at the kind of bare minimum of keeping Gaza quiet um, as part and parcel of an agenda of uh, de facto annexation of the West Bank and um, fanning the flames there. Um, Dana, perhaps you wanna, or Mohammed, if you wanna contribute to this answer as well. Yes, so um, it's a really, really good question. And I wish you with all my heart that we'll get to see your brother soon. Um, it's always when we hear stories like this, it reminds us what we, why we do what we do. Um, so there is the official narrative that you might read about in the press. You might see um, the Hasbara machine is a very effective machine and you will hear it a lot, which is a security argument to say that Israel needs to protect its borders, Hamas is a hostile entity, et cetera, et cetera. Even taken into account, many um, security officials have already said openly that the closure is not beneficial for Israel. 
Um, Israel's currently, as Marianne said, trying to do this thing of keeping Gaza quiet. Keeping Gaza quiet is living in the reality that Mohammed just described, is living in a very harsh humanitarian condition, not collapsing completely. So Israel has an incentive to keep things just about, people just about surviving, but also not thriving. So it's kind of this political interplay that, that is being done on the back of 2.2 million people but um, certainly there's no logic in it. I think, you know, your question is, is really true. We, we ask that every day. There's no reason, there's, there shouldn't be ever any reason to limit people's freedom of movement in that way. But Israel does have an incentive to keep Gaza just about surviving so that just for the political reason of saying, you know, Hamas isn't doing that well. And um, I saw another question, I can maybe take that on in one go around elections in Gaza. So there haven't been elections generally in, in the Palestinian Authority for many years in Gaza, 17, right, Muhammad, I'm, I'm correct. So, you know, it's kind of like trying to keep the situation not exactly excellent so that there's no kind of performance of Hamas that will then do well in other parts of the occupied like, Palestinian territories. So again, it's, it's a political reason. It's not a security reason. It's definitely not humanitarian reason. Israel, as an occupying power, is obliged to um, sustain those people it's occupying, both in the West Bank and in Gaza. But in fact, it doesn't oblige for international law, and it doesn't hold up to its requirements. So that's part of the conundrum we're up against in courts. Yeah. Before I turn to the next questions that are, have come in, and there's some fabulous questions that have streamed in, I just want to add that, again, there, from my perspective and also in Green Olive, there is a logic to the policy. That logic is one of yeah. segregation, of partition, and of divide and conquer um, to segregate Palestinian, fracture Palestinian society so that there cannot be collective mobilizations that are effective. There cannot be a development of communal leadership um, because the society is so fractured by Israeli policy, but it's not a logic that's ethical. And it's not, and there is an absurdity to the, the logic is not sustainable for anyone in the region, Jewish, Palestinian, Christian, anyone, um, to have 2 million people under military closure and other in the West Bank without their rights is not a sustainable, stable environment for everyone to cohabitate in the region. And walls won't divide humanitarian conditions, um, san sanitary conditions, water processing, we are intermingled as populations on the ground, no matter what the policies try to assert. Um, so there's a lot to discuss there. Um, but something that came in the chat that I want to turn to quick is from Susanna asking if Israelis generally know the reality in Gaza and the West Bank and what Isha is doing to engage the Israeli public. So Susanna, I'm going to ask you to unmute if you're there to ask the question yourself. Otherwise, I'll read what you put into the chat. Are you there? Yes. You're muted. You're muted, Susanna, if you can, are able to unmute yourself. Okay, seems like some technical difficulty, though I heard for a moment that you were unmuted and are there. So you asked in the chat, um, do many Israelis know the horror that Palestinians in Gaza and the OPT, the occupied Palestinian territories, go through under the apartheid regime? If they know, is there a way Gisha is engaging them to advocate for Palestinian rights? Um, Mohammed Mayam, okay. I'm happy to hear your thoughts. Um, um, Sure, go ahead. Sure. Um, well, I can say that, um, no, there is, a, there is a kind of, of course there are some people that do know about this, but there is a kind of mystique or kind of like accepted truth that is not a truth in Israeli society that during the disengagement in 2005, Israel kind of wiped its hands of responsibility um, of Gaza, and everything that's happening in Gaza is uh, because of Hamas, and that everything, uh, and that Israel doesn't have responsibility to, um, to like, as they would as an occupying power. Um, so the general, uh, yeah, the general kind of feeling within Israeli society is, is not um, so knowledgeable on, on the actual impacts of closure on daily life. 
Um, Donna, do you want to take the next part of the question in terms yes, of? Yes, sure. There's a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of confusion around Gaza generally and around, um, I would say there's been a very persistent policy of trying to conflate the government, the administration with the people living there. And I think, again, it's kind of a similar cycle to the international cycle in the sense that every time there's an attack on Gaza and then there's discussion of what's going on there, and then some of the statistics do come up in Israeli press or in Israeli circles, um, people are shocked anyway. And I can say anecdotally, I'm Israeli. I was raised not far from Haifa. I spent most of my adult life here. And a lot of my friends are kind of, when I tell them stories such as of our patient, um, uh, um, client or some of the families were trying to reunite, etc. They're completely shocked and they have no idea that they're culprit to this and they're actually implicated in this policy. So I think there's, a, it's again, as Eris said pointedly, it's, it's not incidental that people don't know. It's very, very, um, it, it's a part of the policy. It's keeping people in the dark about what's the country actually doing. Um, so is Gishai advocating opposite to Israeli audiences? Of course, we do that a lot. We have um, both Israeli communication channels. We work a lot with the Israeli press. We do also Israeli public events um, with the recent um, elections and the recent government, and of course, a lot of events in the West Bank where the question was on both. I would say there's also a lot of ignorance of what's happening in the West Bank. We've been using this moment to try and advocate more and to sort of say this is all part of the same policy. Israel was never a democracy. The fact that now things are being done out in the open is just an escalation of something that has been going on for years that those who work in the sector have been seeing for years and years being done um, behind closed doors and now it's being done out in the open. So we're trying to hold on this moment and I think it's also true internationally when people are suddenly appalled and saying this is, has been going on for a while as you heard on the Zoom at least for 60 years if not more in different iterations. Now is the time we can act on it. Important, thank you. Um, there was a question in the chat about um, the violence of Hamas and rockets and such. That wasn't in the question, I'm adding that. Obviously that's much in the news and much reported upon and important to engage with. I guess I'm curious from you, Mohammed, Mayam, or Dana, how does Kishan Center or how would you frame how people abroad can make sense of that and what it means in terms of the their responsibility of Israel to lift restrictions and create better conditions. Or I'm sure you feel questions about this all the time. Sorry, can you, can you just repeat the question one more time? Someone asked about the violence of rockets and of Hamas policies or militants in Gaza um, towards Israelis. Um, often that's cited as a reason that restrictions can't be lifted. Um, it's a very, of course, fraught and difficult question to answer, but it's important to obviously whenever there's a, a flare up in Gaza, these back and forths take place and it's in the international news. I guess I just wanted to hear any perspective I, any of you have as individuals or as people in Gisha advocating for freedom of movement, how you would have people make sense of this. I'll say one thing um, before I pass on to Mohammed um, Odana. Um, that's just to say, we kind of, we kind of mentioned it uh, briefly before, but in terms of uh, security or the security reasons, um, particularly when you see the rockets in the news, um, that if 16 years of closure was meant uh, to destroy Hamas, well, it hasn't worked. So obviously that policy, you know, is ineffectual <laughs> if that's the Israeli reason for the closure. Um, and secondly, we're seeing again and again and again um, uh, wars and assaults and violence. And this is uh, directly implicated by the lack of hope and the lack of like the lack of movement and the lack of ability to live a normal life that you can in Gaza. Um, so, so the security reasons, I think, just from seeing the pattern, um, is are kind of like they're broken down. They're broken down. They don't they don't make sense um, when you just see it point blank in that way. I believe. And Mohammed or Dana, do you want to contribute to this question? I just want to say, I have two things to say, one from the point of view of Gisha and one for myself. So Gisha condemns all violations of international law and all violence and equivocally. So we are shocked and horrified whenever these escalations break out and whenever we see violence on both sides of the border. However, 
it's not a symmetry. We have two two parts of the of, of the territory that are not in equal standing. And as Maya described bluntly, this is a situation in which you have people pushed into such lack of hope that you, you can understand without justifying, which is kind of where we're at. And I have to say, personally, many of us, including myself, I have family in the South who are at the first um, point of contact whenever an escalation breaks out. And there's always this conflict because we are worried. I am, of course, an Israeli citizen, and I'm worried for my friends and family to, to be in this situation. But I'm also aware that they have shelters to run to, whereas the people in Gaza don't, and they have very short warnings. And whenever there's an escalation, we hear more and more about the kind of impossible, it's, as Muhammad described earlier, there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to go. So again, I think it's really important not to fall into the symmetry, but still to condemn violence, which we know will get us nowhere at this point. Mohammed, do you wanna add anything? Yes. Yeah, I want to add something like, uh, I think that this question like connected to the first question, like that this is like shut down while we speak, so I'm sorry. So this question like connected to the first question because he asked the guy originally from Gaza, why they don't create like freedom of movement because they would create a bitter people and good people. So the question is not about Hamas violence, the question about that about this is before Hamas is coming in 2006, 2007, that Israel already like withdraw from Gaza in 2005 and said there's like no responsibility of Israel on Gaza. And the second Intifada started like in 2000, and there's like a clash is happening between the BA, the Palestinian Authority, and Fatah and Hamas with Israel. And they like destroy and like use the airstrike before 2005. So I think what Hamas do and doing, it's like a normal, reaction and resistance happen because if if you create a good like situation with the freedom of movement and i can move for example uh, me and others can walk can move why why they have to do like a, a violence actions and, and aspects and i want to say something maybe it's not represent gisha it's something personal i'm not also the spokesman of hamas but I think like Israel, like it play a role to create this situation to be done. And it play a role to build the violence of Hamas by a way or another. Like, believe, believe me in this, like in 2009, 2010, 2011, when there's like a tunnels because of the closure and everything like smuggling to Gaza, it was under Israeli eye. It was under Israeli technology drones. They see everything. And they not just see or saw that Hamas like smuggling cements and like floor and like animals. They also like smuggling other things. They know this. Why they didn't like take decisions and destroy the tunnels like what they did after 2013, 2014. That's like also a question that we want to ask about. So who create violence? Who create the situations? Who put a people and collectively punish them for more than 16, 17 years old? And the unemployment rate become among the graduation people more than 65 in Gaza when I graduate in a 22 years old, and I don't find work, and I find anyone if he work in violence or work in peace, and ask me to join to do work, I will go there. So you don't give like the people the choices in Gaza. So before speaking about violence, we have to thinking who create the situation, who create the area to be violated. I'm so sorry to say this, but actually I'm like. I'm like Dana, I'm like Mayan. I'm worried about my children when there's escalations, but I cannot imagine that a rocket can fall down in one of my colleagues' home. That's like a humanitarian relations that we have to speak about. Thank you. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, extremely important. And yeah, I just wanna echo again what all of you have said in saying that, uh, of course, 
Also, I condemn all violence in any direction. And we have to look at the larger violence of occupation and military closure to understand this context. People cannot be kept internally for decades without civil rights, stateless, without the ability to move freely, uh, without the ability to move around the world, without the ability to move uh, and visit or go to Jerusalem to visit family members. People cannot be kept without civil rights and basic human rights uh, and expect that the situation and the context won't devolve. That's not to condone violence. It's just to say that interminable occupation and closure cannot but lead to devolution <laughs> for the situation um, and destabilization. And people, of course, deserve to live freely and with dignity. Um, we have time for just another question or two. I'm sorry to say there's so much to discuss and so much that's been touched on by everyone. But Amy, you asked, of course, a very pertinent question. What can people do to end the permanent regime to secure freedom of movement um, from different positions, perhaps around the world or in Israeli society, um, to be in solidarity with Gazans and with Palestinians demanding their rights to life, livelihood, um, and sovereignty? Amy, I'll unmute you if you want to ask yourself. Otherwise, I'll let people respond. Well, um, hold on. Hello. Yeah, um, the question was made general so that you could answer it any way you wanted. But the way you added to my question, because we've been talking about all the um, the political aspect, even though you're often dealing with the legal logistics. Um, and it seems to me we kind of have to um, deal with the political aspect too, if you know what I'm trying to say. Are there things we can do in addition to donating money to your causes, which are very important causes to try to get these policies changed and as i've been listening to this it's hard for me to see how easy it with how different how how we could do that given that a lot of the israeli public itself seems to be in the dark they they seem not to realize the impacts and a lot of people around the world might think Hamas or some of the people on the West Bank are part of the cause, okay? And, and you know, how, how do you get people to act to, to end things that are not just humanitarianly wrong, but counterproductive? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Thank you so much, Amy. That's a great question. Um, no, definitely. I think that it's a big and important question to know what you guys can also do um, to combat uh, efforts by Israel to divide and conquer, to have closure in Gaza, to restrict the freedom of movement. And I see this partly as not separating our discussions about the West Bank from our discussions about Gaza. And I think like as advocates in your community um, to keep Gaza in the conversation, even when there isn't uh, an escalation in violence or um, an attack on Gaza. Um, so just ensuring that it's kept in the conversation so that this can be advocated for in spaces where you might be advocating for already um, against annexation or, or, or settler violence and things like this. Gaza is part and parcel um, of these systems. Donna, do you want to add anything or Mohammed? Yeah, just to reiterate and say that, first of all, we'd be really happy to stay in touch. You can find our contacts easily um, and send any resources. Um, there are many ways in which that sort of things that are ongoing that you can add your voices, write to your MPs, write to your senator, raise with your representatives. Um, Gaza is an important issue internationally. It's something that catches people's eye and something that we all know that we're at the edge of a really, really severe escalation and that there'll be no way back. So your voices at this moment, and at, at sort of, it's always critical, it's always kind of five seconds to midnight in Gaza, but just to, to push your representatives to talk about this, both in Jewish communities and in non-Jewish communities, and just to, to dispel, um, I would say the mystique around Israeli apartheid. Israel is doing a really, really strong job of sort of enabling people to just not talk about what it's doing to keep things on the agenda, both locally in terms of um, talking to your stakeholders, 
um, again, we'd be glad to stay in touch. We'd be glad to send resources. And of course, we'd appreciate any support you're willing to um, provide us. We are an organization, as Marianne said, we first and foremost do legal advocacy because that's how we help people on a daily basis to get the permits that they need in order to survive. But obviously there are many avenues of advocacy that you could get involved or we can support you in, in, in the future. Thank you. And any resources you send, I'll also send to everyone who's joined today. Uh, Mohammed, I'm curious if you want to end uh, with any final thoughts before I close out the call uh, around yeah, responses and questions, or more importantly, what you think is most important for people to take away. Yeah, I want to say like Gaza is a very beautiful place, like, and I want like all the people to come to see, not just like the beach, they can find the beach everywhere. I'm going to speak about the people, kindness of the people, like uh, usually, b b b b like when you come to Gaza, you'll find like a very welcome feelings from the people, for the foreigners. It's not like how you imagine it. The, and also the people here, also they are creative, they want options, they want freedom of movements. And uh, really I like the work of, uh, at Gisha because Sometimes you are able, when the people reach out to us, we can spoke about these sto stories and speak about it. But still, there's like a, most of people in Gaza, they, they need help and they want, we want also to continue to help them. So uh, I invite all the people when there's like options. I know the option is very, very weak and very narrow, but I hope that you can one day come to Gaza and like also like interested. It's its people and its also area. And thank you so much for the invitation. Inshallah. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, truly, thank you for that. And I think I'm left, left from this conversation thinking about the ways that all of this has made such an abstraction for people around the world, and particularly also for people an hour away from Gaza who have no access, that the people are an abstraction and made a statistic that the division between the West Bank and Gaza um, is made in the news and in discourse about numbers and demographic threats and all these things that remove the real texture of lives and people's lived reality. Um, so I wish we could talk, talk much, much, much longer. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Mayan. And thank you, Donna, for your perspective and thoughts. Uh, people should, of course, follow up. Um, and yeah. Thanks again to Gisha for the invaluable perspective uh, and time. And on behalf of everyone, to everyone here in the in the virtual room uh, for joining this call. Uh, I'll put again in the chat now the links to support our work. Um, and as I mentioned at the start of our time, we depend on contributions from you, our wider community, to cover the cost of our events, to sustain our work, to combat the violence of occupation and military closure. Uh, and build a future of equality, justice, and democracy. You can continue, contribute at greenolivetours.com slash contributions, or I saw that Donna put the link to Gisha, gisha.org slash en slash donation. Um, half of your contributions to Green Olive today will go to sustain Gisha in their critical work to protect the freedom of movement of Palestinians, challenge the systems of severe restrictions and closures which govern the lives of Palestinians in contravention of international law, and secure the right to life, medical care, education, livelihood, family unity, and freedom of religion. Your support today will also sustain future Green Olive advocacy initiatives and the work of our incredible tour guides. I saw some people here who have been on our tours, uh, and I'm sure you can vouch for the brilliance of the work being done on the ground in Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Hebron, and throughout the occupied West Bank. Uh, many of you have met our tour guides uh, who are every, way, every day bringing people to visit communities on the ground, hear testimony from Palestinians, and develop relationships with communities living under military occupation whose voices they can then amplify in home communities around the world. Your contributions will help us to create strategic advocacy resources, media trainings, informational films and primers, and other publications and materials whose aim is to expose the larger international community to the reality on the ground in Israel-Palestine, to amplify the voices of human rights defenders like Isha and many, many others doing brilliant work and provide people around the world with the tools they need to engage in meaningful advocacy for the end of the occupation 
and the development of a democratic and just society. Very lastly, uh, we ask those who are wanting to join our work and become today members of Green Olive. Uh, we are closing out our current membership drive. Your membership will allow us to grow as an advocacy center committed to a future beyond apartheid partition and occupation. It will directly support monthly solidarity visits to communities facing displacement in Area C of the West Bank. It will allow our tour guides to develop new tour guiding initiatives, highlighting the lived reality of Palestinians, and it will allow us to sustain global campaigns, encouraging people around the world to take action. Uh, I put all those links again in the chat. Um, and with that, I'll close. Thank you again to Isha and to Mohammed, Mayan, and Dana for this time. Uh, we are excited to be in touch in the future and for partnership. Thank you so much, Aris, for the invitation. And thanks, everyone, for coming today. It was uh, great to see your questions and comments in the chat as well. Thank, thank you. you. Been thank chat. you so much. Yeah, it was interesting for me. And thank you also for the comments and the chat. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Beautiful. Bye. Thanks, all. Have great thank days. You. Stay tuned for updates from Gisha and Green Olive. And be well wherever you are in the world. Talk soon. Bye.